Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, it's your turn. You picked a story. Why don't you tell us what the story is and why you picked it? The story is called God's Work by Kevin Canty. I picked it, actually. This was going to be the first the first story I ever brought to the podcast, but then for various reasons, it was not. We didn't start right away, et cetera, et cetera, and then we did a different story instead. But I thought, hey, we should do that story. I had that idea a long time ago. Very good. And do you have a section you want to read? I do. She comes to fellowship again on Saturday, and afterward, before the hens and chicks take her away, she asks Sander if they can go for a walk on Sunday. No, he tells her, but Monday might be all right. And what are your intentions, his mother asks. I don't have any, Sander says. Anna laughs out loud. They're in the kitchen, Sunday afternoon, summer rain beating against the windows. Sander's still in his Sunday suit, though he's taken his tie off. That's impossible, his mother says. Everybody has intentions, good or bad or all mixed up. What we want, it's what sets people in motion. But you, she says and leans closer, I don't want you to lose your way. She's a very pretty girl. Not really, Sander thinks. Compared with the chicks, maybe. But there are some real knockouts at school. Clara's got the edge, maybe. The interest. She's got a snake tattoo that curls out from under her shirt. A little ways up her neck, emerald and garnet. But there are definitely prettier girls. She doesn't know what she's doing, his mother says. You've seen how she dresses. She has no compass. We're just going for a walk, Sander says. Do you wish me to come along? Oh no, Sander thinks. A hot ball of disappointment rises in his throat. He forces himself to speak. I'd rather you didn't than think of what you are asking. I'll pray on it, Sander says, and his mother radiates approval. And at that exact moment, he splits into two people, the one he has always been and some itchy, wayward newborn. The old Sander will do as his mother asks, will pray and puzzle, working toward the light and out of the morass of sin. The old Sander thrills at his mother's smile, at her approval, old Sander full of grace. The newborn Sander schemes, that night in his bed as he is supposed to be searching his conscience. He thinks instead of the snake tattoo, he thinks about what exactly he might say to his mother to keep her from chaperoning, without thinking whether this might be lies or truth. His dreams are full of open windows, speeding cars. The ex-presidents of the Elks laugh down at him. I'm kind of glad we're reading this now instead of a year and a half ago. I'm kind of cringing at like what stupid observations I might have made now that I'm such a well-developed human. (laughs) So what do you like about this story? At least we have a well-developed podcast anyway. Yes, exactly. I like the story. I I don't know. I like the, you know, internal struggle, the depiction of that. I think it's well-written. It's well, it's well-evoked. It's um, engaging and uh, gripping, even though not a lot happens. So I like that. I always like that in a story. That feels like that's always my answer. What do you like about this story? It was fun to read. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's a ringing endorsement considering how much stuff I feel like I force myself to read to find something to share even. Yeah, yeah. I probably read like five or 10 stories before I finish one and then say, oh, this is good enough to read. Good enough. (laughs) I finished it. (laughs) Yeah. And sometimes I read like three paragraphs and I send it to you before I finish because I'm like, this is good shit. This is going to be, yeah, yeah, that's good. One of the first things that this reminded me of when I started reading, because I think really early on in that first section, there's a reference to like pubic hair that he saw on some girl. And then he's talking about like how later, how he like undresses every single girl that he sees with his eyes, like trying to guess what's underneath. And it's like slightly graphic in those places. And it reminded me of the AMP story. Oh yeah, a little bit. I can see that. Okay, but the difference obviously is that both both of these boys are of that age when all they can think about is bodies of teenage girls. And it's totally, totally normal. And in the a and story, it's cute. And there's something nostalgic about it. And it reminds you of simpler times, right? That boy wants nothing but good things from those girls. He's not looking at those girls in a gross way. He's not embarrassed. He's, he's more like um, in awe of them. They're specimens or something to him. And in this case, poor Sander has been so totally fucked up by his religion and his mother that he's made to feel as if this is perverted you know and whether or not he believes it you know that that it is perverted or that it's wrong or that it's sinful like his struggle with how to interpret his own feelings is the problem like the feelings are normal and he and here he is 
telling himself that he shouldn't be having them, that he wishes he were pure like his mother. You know, oh, come on. You don't know a thing about your mother. It made me feel so bad for him. And especially when you, in the context of his religion, which is the idea that this is all going to be gone. There's that really good scene with Clara in the woods when they go on the walk after the passage that you read. And he's blown away because she articulates his feeling as a newbie to his religion. She says something about like how beauty is fleeting and passing and how sad that one day the world will continue without humans who have, you know, ascended to this heavenly space and how they'll miss out on it. And here's Sander. All he wants to do is cop a feel. And that's what he's lamenting, right? He knows that even this primal desire, which he thinks is sinful, is not something that he's going to be allowed to have. And he's not thinking about like how beautiful the woods are. You know, he's thinking about like simple pleasures in the context of his overall life that he's going to miss out on. Clara is fleeting. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You've mentioned that uh, his feelings are normal, but it's interesting how his religious background and the way that that makes him think about these things. Because we're in, our, in his head, so we're seeing this through his eyes. The way that completely changes our perspective on it because of the way it's presented through his eyes. Like something so, I don't know, it becomes a life and death, death struggle for him, right? This bifurcation. Then that passage I read where it says he splits into two people. The one he's always been in some itchy way were newborn. I guess I guess that's the the religion makes that creates that situation and makes this story basically right, which is you know that's what the story is about. I just I, I feel so bad for this kid. Like you said, it, it is his. I forget your wording already, but it's the forefront of his mind. This struggle. Yeah, it's something that I I should probably uh, not put on the podcast, but maybe I'll just say it is. Uh, in a lot of ways, this feels like he's being abused, psychologically abused, and um, this is like one of the, th- the ways in which religion can be abusive. Right. I think there's better ways to do it, obviously, but if you let it dig into your psyche like that, it can uh, the results can be not good. Right. In the woods, in that same scene, when Clara articulates, you know, the sadness that he feels with the whole concept of their religion, there's a moment that passes between them that he kind of misses out on where he, I think at one point, like wants to like physically reach out and touch her and and he lets that pass and then she says something else and then he finally puts his hand on her leg and then she tells him, no, I don't want that from this relationship. Like she really sees him as an expert and a peer on the religion and she wants to learn from him but to your point about some parts of religion like this being kind of damaging to a kid at that age you know when when it's all or nothing um and you have to like buy into something when you don't understand the whole world yet oh yeah he i think misses an opportunity there not just for like his own personal connection but for what it is his mom is trying to do when she goes door to door he could have I think like easily converted that girl if he had been given any tools in his life to relate to other people, let alone girls of the opposite sex. And then ultimately we see Clara leave and it's not his fault, but it feels like a missed opportunity. It feels like a battle he decided he was going to lose going into it. Just, you know, the same way they go door to door and he feels defeated before they knock, you know, he knows it's unlikely in most of these scenarios that people are going to answer, let alone invite you in, let alone show up at church, which is obviously why we're hearing about Claire in the first place. She's an anomaly. Yeah. It's even that scene when his mom offers him Taco Bell and he's like, no, I don't want any. He says, I don't know. I don't care. Are you hungry or not? He says he is hungry. He's always hungry, but he doesn't want to go there in this new suit and with his haircut and he doesn't want to go with his mother. He says, I'll pass, I guess. Well, I'm starving his mother says and she sits there and eats really slowly in front of him and like deliberately taking her time just reading her bible and he suffers through all that never says a word it feels like it's not just the prurient interests of like girls and that stuff he everything in his life is this he's being dominated in some way i don't know that she's doing it deliberately he somehow internalized this this struggle right yeah and i think it's important to point out how the story starts This is another thing I wanted to point out when it comes to like how the story is crafted. But the first line is Sanders loves his mother. Yeah. And it talks about him following literally in her footsteps up to the front door of this place. And he's, you know, kind of marveling at the way she looks, but the idea that she's kind of pure and beautiful and simple and embodies kind of the admirable qualities of their religion. And he wishes that he could just kind of effortlessly 
do the same the way his mom does. But that's the other part that I think is sad is that he thinks that she has always been this way, you know, that she's always understood her place in this religion and accepted it without question. And she's never been confused. And if she's been sinful, she's prayed it away, you know, but she's doing her son a disservice because she's telling him that, you know, that she doesn't have those thoughts. She's acting like she's perfect. And so how does he grapple with this? If he, if he thinks everyone around him has a handle on it and just mentioning that he's struggling is going to give himself away. That's what feels messed up about it. He's like walking around thinking he's the only one screwing up and he's not screwing up and he's not the only one. <laughs> yeah. Even, um, where is that? So she goes in the water. Uh, Clara goes in the water and she says, uh, come in. You know, he's, she's inviting him into the water and he's like, yes. Oh yes. <laughs> but what's he going to do? Take his pants off? Cause she was able to hitch up her skirt and not get it wet. And then he says, also, this is sin. And he knows it. This is the lure of the flesh. This is the moment they have been warning him about all of them. They're setting, like, he has internalized this idea that he has to be pure, like you said, using his mother as the model. But what he hasn't internalized are the tools by which to do that, right? It's just like, I have to just brute force, like, hold my breath and do it <laughs> without any kind of guidance. Right. It's like in Catholicism where they don't talk about contraceptive, only abstinence, and then they wonder why people get pregnant. That's right. It's like, because you haven't taught them anything. You've given them an impossible task and no tools. Back to the beginning of the story, what I liked about that opening section is how Canty bookends the opening. So he says, Sanders loves his mother, and then he explains. And then at the end, he says again, Sander loves his mother, like two or three paragraphs later. I thought that worked so well as a uh, opening paragraph. And it's not like my key takeaway here, but, I, but it did stick out to me as something kind of simple that you can do to make your reader think you're <laughs> kind of clever. <laughs> If you have an opening line and you bookend it three paragraphs later, I'm reading it thinking this writer knows what they're about to do. You know, he set something up there and then he like launched. Yeah. You know, when we read the first one of those and we don't know what's coming, we read it one way. But after we've read everything that comes in between, the second one has lands in a completely different way. Uh If you have a good line, kind of encompassing line like that, that really captures the character on multi levels, you can give them the first level in the beginning and then set up the second one so that it lands differently. And then you're giving two levels with the same line or several levels with the same line. Right. It works really well. Yeah. The bit about the uh, Taco Bell is what threw me trying to figure out what time period this was because I think this has to do with their religion too. You know, they're they're not carrying cell phones. They're not talking about any other like modern day marker except Taco Bell. (laughs) That really threw me for a loop because this seems like it could be set, you know, in the 50s or something or in the 60s or in the 70s or in the 20s. I have no clue, but the story is timeless that way. And the characters are kind of, you know, like simple and pure that way. This could be a struggle he's having with these like sexual urges in the 20s or now right? He's describing them almost with the same innocence. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's some of the clothing choices and like uh, the way Clara is described and her first meeting kind of said it as relatively modern, even though it's not, you probably couldn't nail down if this was from like 1995 or 2015. Right. I mean, how long has Taco Bell been around? I don't know. Gotta Google it. <laughs> I thought too, the section that you were reading, I didn't catch this the first time, but it felt important the second time when uh, Sanders' mom is asking him what his intentions are and his response is, I don't have intentions. That to me felt, that felt like the truest statement. He's trying his best not to have intentions, if nothing else. Like he's hoping things will happen, but he doesn't know how to make them happen. It's almost impossible. Like he has no game. So like, how is he going to like make these little fantasies come true right he tries by touching your leg and when it falls flat he half expects it and then you know at the end he's talking about how um the dad takes claire away and he's like what could i have done i couldn't have done anything but i watched her go and then it's kind of i i think it's kind of a flat ending i didn't feel some kind of like i didn't feel much at the end but the very final paragraph is talking about how he starts going door to door again with his mom yeah and 
and there he is just following her again and ugh, what a terrible religion like what in real life would bring sanders the most joy is having a total normal like sexual experience with this girl even if she's just like kissing her like that's all like imagine what that would do for this kid yeah that is his nirvana and what they're describing in their religion is that all of this is nothing just wait until you get to heaven and this kid can't even fathom what mortal happiness is let alone this other place that he's got to wait for that he's told is going to be real cool because god's there except like is claire going to be there you know that's all this kid wants and they're not even that's what's baffling to me is that you know a true connection with this girl even if it was like a high school fling could be powerful and meaningful and beautiful and good for him and good for her and you know but instead he's told that because he shouldn't look at her all of it's bad you know he doesn't even know how to have an authentic interaction with this girl and he's got to wait for heaven which is gonna be so much better than not getting your pants wet in the creek with your crush like what this poor kid yeah he he's so in he, he, he doesn't even see he doesn't get it he doesn't see it he doesn't he's confused but he doesn't understand the full scope of what's at play here what he's being denied I, he doesn't even fully understand what what he's missing out on oh yeah yeah absolutely you you mentioned he put his hand on her leg or something that's like the only thing he does in the yes. entire story and i think one of the reasons that the ending i didn't feel like the ending was was i i thought it was satisfying because it, it finished the arc but he doesn't it's not it, it, the ending is he continues to not do anything right yes. <laughs> so in, in this way like this story isn't about a character changing no. it's about a character just wrestling with their internal the dichotomy of their soul you know whatever it's just an internal struggle throughout and then being left with it like right. okay i have to go forward with this internal struggle forever <laughs> well the other thing i meant to mention about the section that you read is that after sander says i don't have any intentions his mother comes back and says that's impossible possible everybody has intentions good or bad are all mixed up what we want it's what sets people in motion which is such a meta comment on fiction and what you always talk about which is like you know characters are their decisions and yet here is sander who hasn't made a single one except to like try his damnedest to like you know he's not like you said, doing anything. He's, he's making choices, but almost choices not to act. You know, they're all choices not to to do these things or just, just to kind of like go with the flow, right? I mean, even when he tries to tell his mom he's not hungry, she's, he still has to go to Taco Bell. So he's not saying, I'm going to sit in the car even. Like other people are making choices for him. And, and like you said, there's still a lot going on because of how he's dealing with it. If this was like a third person story and it was like farther removed from his brain, this would be the worst fucking story in the world right it'd be like sander the bump on a log goes to taco bell and sits quietly you know he, he doesn't do anything yeah the story is in his head that's right we have to be in his thoughts we have to feel his struggle his internal struggle as much as we can in order to really appreciate this as a story that's right that's right <laughs> So this guy, Kevin Canty, he was at the Sanibel Writers Workshop. And then I bought his book, which was Underworld. And it was about like a, I don't know if it was West Virginia, but it was a coal mining town. It was deceptively like more modern day than it read in a lot of ways. And when I remembered that book while reading the short story, I, I could see like all the similarities in his voice. And one of the things, I'm not going to articulate this well, but I think it's important for a character like Sander, especially who, who like we said, is confused he knows that much but he doesn't understand this, the true scope of his own confusion even to be told in this point of view by a narrator like this you know who's constantly telling us like how sander feels sander is confused but he but he's not saying sander is confused sander is confused he's so confused he doesn't know what he thinks like he, he's thinking a little more than that right he's thinking i want to see what this girl looks like naked but i'm not supposed to think about what she looks like naked and this is what mom says this is what, you know like so he's he's thinking through all of it but anyway there's something about the voice of the narrator that feels like an authority on Sander. Like he's coming to the story and this felt similar for the story of the underworld. He is maybe not like a present narrator with like a body or like an actual, you know, it's not like Kevin Canty's telling me the story, but the narrator is telling us everything as it is. There's nothing left like to the imagination or that the narrator is unsure of. I don't know. There's like an authority to the voice where it's kind of like, this is how it is that I don't know like I said I'm, I'm gonna fail to articulate this but 
if you read Kevin Canty, I, f- I feel like at least the two things now that I've read, that's what feels consistent. It's just kind of a matter of fact. This is what the character thinks is what happens. This is how they're dealing with it. I think I know what you mean. I haven't read anything else he's written, but I think I know what you mean because there's very little between us it's, even though it's in the third person, like you said, it's very little between us and his thoughts, Sanders' thoughts, because they're just given to us as they are. There's a couple of, I mean, there's obviously narration as well, like what is um, so-and-so doing? There's an interesting, I don't know, if maybe this could fit into that, but that part where I read, so it's describing Clara coming to the fellowship on Saturday, and um, she asks Sander if they can go for a walk on Sunday. No, he tells her, which is not in quotes, but later when he speaks, it is in quotes, but that's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of his dialogue that's in his head. Yeah, I don't know. So no, he tells her, but Monday might be all right. And there's no break. There's no other lines. It goes immediately to, and what are your intentions? His mother asks. This is like uh, in a film where it'd just be right. like a cut, jump, right, cut, or jump yeah. cut or something like that. Yeah. Right to a different conversation because those things are connected, right? And Sander right. connects them. Sander's thoughts connect them and the narrator is connecting them. So that's kind of kind of an example of what you're talking about. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, but. no, I know what you mean. Like there's an authority even to the fact that we jumped between the invite and the scene in the kitchen. He's just telling you what you need to know in that moment. Yeah. So... I'm not sure that you can attempt that. I think it's almost something that comes with experience and then all of a sudden you're doing it and you don't realize it. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I set out to match the tone in a, in a certain way, I don't know that I could do it. I think it comes from knowing your characters in and out, knowing the story really well, and then almost writing it, having sorted out all the problems in your head beforehand. Like when people talk about how, oh, you know, I just came up with a character that I put it on the page and they tell me what's going to happen next. Like, I don't think Kevin Canty does that. Yeah, so don't, don't try to copy this, but do try to get to know your characters in a way that you can kind of lay it out with that expertise almost like i feel like he knows his subject matter through and through and that's why he can put it plainly yeah i think you said the word authority it made me think of uh something john gardner said but i couldn't remember exactly but he talked about authority in uh one of the books but i think it boils down to like you said command of the material and that material being the elements of fiction which are character story you know when to when to tell us what's going on when to show us how characters are when to get into somebody's head and like this story we're in his thoughts we know everything we need to know about him and that's part of what establishes that authority is we feel the completeness of the story oh yeah that's a good word for it it feels whole as if we're you know if we had to ask kevin what does this guy look like he could probably tell us and yeah it feels like there's probably a lot of work being done off the page that makes this the believable story that it is yeah one thing I uh, I do want to say, it's not really negative, <laughs> but it's like this is written in the present tense. You know, Clara turns up at Fellowship. She seeks out Sander and says, blah, blah, blah. There was a couple of moments when reading, usually when you read present tense, if I read present tense, I don't notice. After the first couple of lines, I don't notice anymore. Right. But in this story, there were a few moments here and there where I suddenly was jostled back into like, oh, wait, this isn't present tense. Oh, yeah. this. Then obviously, I am the kind of person who notices that thing in the first place because I'm a, a writer. When I read, despite how much I try not to be, I pay attention to that kind of thing. But it just made me think, I don't think this needs to be in the present tense. Like, I don't know what it gains by being in the present tense there's nothing nothing wrong with it um it's just back to my my um endless fascination or confusion by why people write in the present tense yeah i don't know for a story like this i guess we want to know that sander doesn't know how it turns out and isn't telling this after the fact There's like an immediacy to the idea that Clara appears in his life and could be something. And so when we kind of see things unfold, like she does this and then she does that instead of she did this and then she did that. Yeah, that could be an excuse for it. That makes sense. To your point, I think by the time you're reading it and you're enjoying it and you've turned off the writer part of your brain, the effect is the same. But I sometimes wonder if that's like the unconscious decision is that the author is like, how do I make this feel like it's happening right now oh i do present tense yeah even though all the other tenses feel like they're happening right now yeah i don't know there's this uh one thing um after fellowship the hens and chicks of the congregation spirit clara away and he doesn't see her again he will never see her again 
the shift to he will never see her again. And that feels authoritative at that moment, but it turns out it's just his thought. It's his feeling. Because the next paragraph, but she comes to fellowship again on Saturday. And so he does see her again. So I think that's one of those moments that kind of lends support to what you're saying is that switch to future tense. We don't know what's going to happen next. We get a sense that he doesn't know what's going to happen next. Whereas in the past tense, this doesn't, I don't think this really affects it, but the excuse would be the author, we assume the author does know what happens next, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a sense in which it's already completed. Right. Yeah. There's two little moments in here I wanted to mention. One of them is when that the section I read, it said when he said, um, I'll pray on it, Sanders says, and his mother radiates approval. And at that exact moment, he splits into two people, the one he has always been and some itchy wayward newborn. The first time I reread this, when I was like, let's do this story for the podcast, and I reread it, I put a big star next to it, and I said, this is why the story is in the New Yorker, because of that personal, the internal bifurcation. And he carries through the metaphor, you know, the next paragraph is, the old Sander will do this, and the newborn Sander does this. It's those little kind of things, I don't know how to, how to say it exactly. It's like the story is good enough on its own, but that's an example almost of like how it's expertly delivered. Yeah, it's exploring something deeper than the mere events of the story yeah and i don't know i feel like a writer maybe like at my level where i'm reading these things and i'm i'm like i've got the basics down right i can write a story that you remember the way you remember this story about sander right i can probably come up with something in a character and like execute well enough but then to get to kevin canty's level i would have to think really hard about adding things like that kind of after the fact as craft and i i might be able to then achieve achieve it if I thought about how to include it or what to include without it being like kind of over the top but I'm not yet at the level where that would come to me naturally you know yeah yeah I, so I always wonder when I see it and when people like you point it out like did it come naturally or did he sit there and think you know if I want to get it in the New Yorker it needs a little something else a little spice <laughs> like breaks and drop caps I think uh there, you know, it's the old argument about literature is it, sure it's exciting, sure it's um, fun to read, but the best literature speaks to the universal human condition. Yeah, and I think those are the moments that people are looking for, and that's the moments that people want that grab people's attention and say, "Okay, I'm going to publish this in the New Yorker." For example, it's like, "Oh yeah, this is reaching for something bigger." Mm -hmm. There's also this other moment where she, he's telling her about faith. Where do you get it? Yeah, he says, "I don't, I don't know. Sometimes it works." Blah blah. Blah, blah. Uh, oh, she takes his hand and says, thank you. Thank you for being honest. Oh, Sander says and blushes. I'm not supposed to do that, am I? She says, dropping his hand. And Sander almost catches the moment, almost manages to hold on. It's all right, he says, no harm done. That little uh, moment where he says he almost catches the moment, almost manages to hold on. This is like uh, the prose is kind of reaching for something. It's like gesturing at something big that it can't encompass. It can't get its words around. It's another one of those kind of things that I feel like like the best fiction does sometimes where it kind of hints at larger things. It, it doesn't literally say, I can't describe this or I don't have the words to describe this, but you get that sense of something big. Right. Yeah, I love that scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This has become just like a list of things that you might be able to do to get into the New Yorker. Oh, yeah. That's the whole purpose of this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how to get into the new yorker by two people who have never done it that's right <laughs> <laughs> well what is your takeaway from this it's kind of lame but my takeaway is basically that you can have a character that has an internal struggle and the story just follows that struggle kind of gives it shape doesn't really resolve it and then is still satisfying like you it's possible to do that that's basically my so i guess my takeaway should be how that's done and i guess the way that's done is by having contained events you know like meeting clara and then Clara being pulled away by her father is kind of like the the plot that holds that conflict together, that holds that the uh, um the bounds of that struggle into a story. But the story itself is about him and the internal struggle he has. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to frame almost any story. And something that I feel like I do when I'm trying to come up with something to write. It's like I, I'm really good at coming up with the first part, but like not the plot part <laughs> that illustrates it, you know? But if you can do both, or if you're the plot person and you need 
need to illuminate this harder to reach and tangible struggle thing. Yeah. Like just decide if you're illustrating something beyond the confines of the plot. And if you're not, I probably don't want to read it in a short story. You know, like maybe in a novel, you know, give me plot all day. I mentioned the, the Taco Bell thing earlier, but I think the Taco Bell story of him wanting to eat, saying no, and then suffering through is kind of the same story, but just really small within the, the bigger story. Right. And that's a good point. It, it doesn't have to be illustrated with a girl, although this is like the most dramatic. And if you want to get in the New Yorker, it has to be a little longer <laughs> than right. the uh, Taco Bell scene. <laughs> that's right. But yes, that that's a good example. And and you could probably pick a, t- a ton of tiny, like micro fictions out of longer works that way. And that goes back to kind of a theory we've talked about where it's like a short story, each scene should be like a, like a proof and a theorem, right? Does it illustrate the larger point? And if it doesn't, you probably need to cut it. So the Taco Bell scene, even if we're just enjoying it for reasons we don't understand, it, it really is bolstering, like you said, like it's illustrating the larger under. And it serves a function in the story too as being a standalone scene that establishes who the characters are. Yes, because it's early on. Yeah. My takeaway is not very good either, but just kind of what I what we were talking about when we talked about the authority in his voice, I think it really does come from knowing his material. And like you said, knowing, understanding like how fiction works and executing it well. But I think I'm usually cutting corners when it comes to knowing my material well. Oh yes. I do that. Yeah. I've, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I got enough here. Let's go. And um, maybe I should think about it a little harder or sometimes I think about it so hard that I don't write it. <laughs> but then sometimes like I'll, I'll, think about something for a long time and then when I finally come to it it just it comes out in one sitting and I can like fine tune it and I'm, it's, I'm not saying it's perfect but I'm saying that I as the writer am confident in where I'm taking this story other times if I sit down with a half-formed idea and I'm like inspired in the moment that's when I get writer's block you know and I, I get annoyed and I put it away because it's too hard right but if you really know your stuff then you can like kind of just sing you're just going and it's just flowing and, and you are an authority you've thought this through you know what's next and the experience for the readers is, is that much better for it so i don't know do your homework <laughs> that's good takeaway do your homework uh, last episode was have fun and now it's do your homework <laughs> well school's back in session so that's right all right very good thank you listeners If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.